Section nine of Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hume's essays he read at first with delight, one by one as they came out, and still reads them with it. They are so sweetly written. One of the first writers of any country. His pupil Smith, far, very far below him. His theory of moral sentiments, nonsense. His wealth of nations, full of important facts, but written with a wicked view. Hume's history, bad in its tendency. He first wrote the history of the Stuarts, falsely, and then wrote the others to justify and accord with it. Spoke with contempt of Gibbon's history, though he called him a superior man. Instead of writing because he had something to say, he began life with a determination to write a book of some kind or other. Admired his letter on the government of Bern. How clearly has Gibbon revealed his character? A man of bad principles, either private or public, had better let his bitterest enemy write his life than venture to do it himself. When Dr. Beden met me in St. Paul's churchyard and said he was to be Bishop of Gloucester, then, said I, I suppose I must never call you Dick again. Why, replied Beden, pausing at every word, I don't exactly see the necessity of that. Couldn't I? The extreme intimacy between Horne Took and Dr. Beden, and the very high opinion the bishop entertained of his friend, are shown in the evidence given by the bishop on Horne Took's trial for high treason, November the 20th, 1794. Evidence highly creditable to both parties. End of footnote. A man with a little mind will educate his son below himself and keep him there that he may say, what a wise man my father is. My father is a rich grocer. The more wretched people are, the severer and necessarily are the punishments. A soldier and a sailor are punished for mutiny and desertion with stripes and death because the situation they would escape from is so very terrible. And you may always judge of the comfort or misery of a people by the severity of their penal laws. An affected man cannot be a moral man. The whole study of his life is to cheat you. I would rather at any time lose a cause than be condemned to hear Adair gain it for me. Footnote. Sergeant Adair was one of the counsel for the Crown on the trial of Horn Took for high treason in 1794. End of footnote. There are men who pretend they come into the world booted and spurred to ride you. I have made a point of reading all the dramatic writings in every language I know. I read constantly the Arabian Nights over once in two years, and often once a year. In French. When in the Tower I read Tom Jones and Gilles Blas again, and some other novels which a warder's wife lent me. Footnote. In the Tower he was without the privilege of reading and writing for a fortnight. They then sent him three volumes, one of Locke, one of Chaucer, and Wilkins's essay. These were found on his table at Wimbledon, and he was supposed to be reading them. End of footnote. It is best to let children read what they like best, till they have formed a taste for reading, and not to direct what books they shall read. When young and long afterwards, I read without method. The taxes at Genoa were sold to individuals, so that the prosperity of the state, making them more productive, only enriched the purchasers. A nobleman, Grifoni, with immense possessions, retired early and lived most penuriously to the great indignation and contempt of his fellow citizens. At last, in his old age, he came out, sacrificed his fortune and its accumulations to the redemption of the taxes, 
and relieved the people from the intolerable burden. What was the consequence? The government went to war again and laid on war. Such would be the consequence here. The redemption of our debt would be a great calamity. The difficulty of extorting money checks the abuse of power. War begets poverty, poverty, peace. Do as you will be done by is a scoundrel and paltry precept. A generous man goes beyond it. No man shall be allowed to bequeath his property to any descendant unborn. What affection can he feel for such an heir? What relationship is there between a man and his grandson? Do you set any value on a cucumber because it sprung from your own excrement? A man has little or no friendship for any human being, and he determines to lock up his property. He therefore leaves it to the offspring of his brother's youngest child. Would you allow such a thing in a state? No, surely. Wilkes desired that his tomb should be inscribed J. W., a friend to liberty, and I'm glad he was not ashamed to show a little gratitude to her in his old age, for she was a great friend to him. When I was travelling through Italy, the post boy cursed all the saints in paradise and five miles round. Why five miles round? Because some of them may be at their country houses. When Bonaparte comes to England, his curse, therefore, will not reach me at Wimbledon. Pa, said Lord to Tuke, should follow property. Very well, he replied. Then we will take the property from you, and the power shall follow it. No man can bring himself to believe that he shall die. My brother, who left me a hundred a year and pronounced himself at the point of death, desired that such and such things might be returned to him if he recovered. His son had just returned from India, dismissed from some military situation for misconduct. He called in the evening at his father's gate. Tuke was fortunately from home and has since refused to see him. He has now enlisted as a private into the dragoons. Tuke spoke of it as a great calamity. Three years ago, he felt uncommonly well and promised himself a happy summer, but something, he thought, must happen to prevent it. He was so perfectly free from trouble. His daughters in vain endeavoured to dissuade him from it. In May, he was apprehended and confined. The same presentiment for the same reasons had now returned and had just been fulfilled. The great use of education is to give us confidence and to make us think ourselves on a level with other men. An uneducated man thinks there is a magic in it and stands in awe of those who have had the benefit of it. It does little for us. No man, as Selden says, is the wiser for his learning. When children read to you what they do not understand, their minds are exercised in affixing ideas to the words. At least it was so with me. So I understand, Mr. T., you have all the blackguards in London with you, said O'Brien to him on the hustings at Westminster. I'm happy to have it, sir, on such good authority. Now, young man, as you have settled in town, said my uncle, I would advise you to take a wife. With all my heart, sir, whose wife shall I take? As to the prisoners under sentence, it is but an unhappiness for a few days. Not one of them but wishes he had died last week. Think nothing of style as style. Truth is all I wish for. Man is a little kingdom, and if he makes one passion a favourite at the expense of the rest, he must be miserable. The rest will demand satisfaction. I have always least to say in the company of pretty women, for it is then I am most anxious to recommend myself. 
in england the people believe once a week on a sunday the hand of the law is on the poor and its shadow on the rich lord grey eighteen thirty seven if i was compelled i said somewhere publicly to make a choice i should not hesitate to prefer despotism to anarchy then you would do replied tooke as your ancestors did at the reformation they rejected purgatory and kept hell oh the fallibility of medical people both pearson and klein on one occasion informed tooke that he could not possibly survive beyond a single day and he lived years let me mention here what i was told by a lady at clifton in my girlhood she said i had a very severe illness during which i heard dr turton declare to my mother in the next room that i could not live i immediately called out but i will live dr turton and here i am now sixty years old end of section nine Section 10 of Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I knew Joseph Wharton well. When Matthias attacked him in the pursuits of literature for reprinting some loose things in his edition of Pope, Joseph wrote a letter to me in which he called Matthias his pious critic. Rather an odd expression to come from a clergyman. He certainly ought not to have given that letter of Lord Cobham. I never saw Thomas Wharton. I once called at the house of Robinson the bookseller for Dr. Kippers, who used to introduce me to many literary parties, and who that evening was to take me to the Society of Antiquaries. He said, Tom Wharton is upstairs. How I now wish that I had gone up and seen him. His little poem, The Suicide, is a favourite of mine. Nor did I ever see Gibbon or Cooper or Horace Walpole. And it is truly provoking to reflect that I might have seen them. There is no doubt that Matthias wrote The Pursuits of Literature, and a dull poem it is, though the notes are rather piquant. Gilbert Wakefield used to say that he was certain that Rennell and Glynn assisted Matthias in it, and Wakefield was well acquainted with all the three. Stevens once said to Matthias, Well, sir, since you deny the authorship of the pursuits of literature, I need have no hesitation in declaring to you that the person who wrote it is a liar and a blackguard. In one of the notes was a statement that Bellow had received help from Pawson in translating our siphon. Pawson accordingly went to Bellow and said, As you know, I did not help you. Pray write to Matthias and desire him to alter that note. In a subsequent edition, the note was altered. One day I asked Matthias if he wrote the pursuits of literature, and he answered, My dear friend, can you suppose that I am the author of that poem when there is no mention made in it of yourself? Some time after, I happened to call on Lord Bessper, who told me that as he was illustrating the pursuits of literature with portraits, he wanted to get one of me. Why? exclaimed I. There's no mention in it of me. He then turned to the note where I am spoken of as the banker who dreams of Parnassus. What popularity Cooper's task enjoyed! Johnson, the publisher, told me that in consequence of the great number of copies which had been sold, he made a handsome present to the author. In order to attain general popularity, a poem must have what it is creditable to our countrymen that they look for, a strong religious tendency, and must treat of subjects which require no previous knowledge in the readers. Cooper's poems are of that description. Here are two fine lines in Cooper's task. Knowledge is proud that he has learned so much. Wisdom is humble that he knows no more. Sometimes in his rhymed poetry the verses run with all the years of prose, for instance. 
the path of sorrow and that path alone leads to the land where sorrow is unknown cumberland was a most agreeable companion and very entertaining converser his theatrical anecdotes were related with infinite spirit and humour his description of mrs siddons coming off the stage in the full flush of triumph and walking up to the mirror in the green room to survey herself was admirable he said that the three finest pieces of acting which he had ever witnessed were garrick's lear henderson's falstaff and cook's iago when cumberland was composing any work he never shut himself up in his study he always wrote in the room where his family sat and did not feel the least disturbed by the noise of his children at play beside him lord holland and lord lansdowne having expressed a wish to be introduced to cumberland i invited all the three to dine with me it happened however that the two lords paid little or no attention to cumberland though he said several very good things scarcely speaking to him the whole time something had occurred in the house which occupied all their thoughts and they retired to a window and discussed it mitford the historian of greece possessed besides his learning a wonderful variety of accomplishments i always felt the highest respect for him when not long before his death i used to meet him in the street bent almost double and carrying a long staff in his hand he reminded me of a venerable pilgrim just come from Jerusalem. His account of the Homeric age of the Sicilian cities and several other parts of his history are very pleasing. Lane made a large fortune by the immense quantity of trashy novels which he set forth from his Minerva Press. I perfectly well remember the splendid carriage in which he used to ride and his footmen with their cockades and gold-headed canes nowadays as soon as a novel has had its run and is beginning to be forgotten out comes an edition of it as a standard novel in company with my sister i paid a visit to gilbert wakefield when he was in dorchester jail his confinement was made as pleasant to him as possible for he had nearly an acre of ground to walk about in but still the sentence passed upon him was infamous what rulers we had in those days footnote gilbert wakefield was born in seventeen thirty six and entered holy orders in seventeen ninety he joined a dissenting college at hackney but soon left it subsequently published pamphlets against public worship and government and finally a famous letter to Watson, Bishop of Landau, for which he was prosecuted and imprisoned. He died shortly after his release in 1801. End of footnote. Wakefield gave Bellow some assistance in translating Aulus Gellius. At a splendid party given by Lord Hampden to the Prince of Wales, etc., I saw Lady Hamilton go through all those attitudes which have been engraved, and her performance was very beautiful indeed. Her husband, Sir William, was present. Lord Nelson was a remarkably kind-hearted man. I have seen him spin a teetotum with his one hand a whole evening for the amusement of some children. I heard him once, during dinner, utter many bitter complaints which Lady Hamilton vainly attempted to check, of the way he had been treated at court that forenoon. The Queen had not condescended to take the slightest notice of him. In truth, Nelson was hated at court. They were jealous of his fame. There was something very charming in Lady Hamilton's openness of manner. She showed me the neckcloth which Nelson had on when he died. Of course, I could not help looking at her with extreme interest, and she threw her arms round my neck and kissed me. She was latterly in great want, and Lord Stowell never rested till he procured for her a small pension from government. Parson Este was well acquainted with Mrs. Robinson, the once celebrated Perdita, 
and said that Fox had the greatest difficulty in persuading the Prince of Wales to lend her some assistance when towards the close of life she was in very straitened circumstances. Estée saw her funeral, which was attended by a single mourning coach. One morning I was about to mount my horse to ride into London to the banking house, when, to my astonishment, I read in the newspapers that a summons had been issued to bring me before the Privy Council. I immediately proceeded to Downing Street and asked to see Mr. Dundas. I was admitted and I told him that I had come to inquire the cause of the summons which I had seen announced in the newspapers. He said, Have you a carriage here? I replied, A hackney coach. Into it we got. And there was I, sitting familiarly with Dundas, whom I had never before set eyes on. We drove to the Home Office, and I learned that I had been summoned to give evidence in the case of William Stone, accused of high treason. Long before this, I had met Stone in the Strand, when he told me, among other things, that a person had arrived here from France to gather the sentiments of the people of England concerning a French invasion, and that he, Stone, would call upon me and read to me a paper on that subject. I said, You will infect me with the plague, and we parted. In the course of a few days, he did call with the paper. After the government had laid hold of Stone, he mentioned his intercourse with me, and hence my summons. When his trial took place, I was examined by the Attorney-General and cross-examined by Erskine. For some time before the trial, I could scarce get a wink of sleep. The thoughts of my appearance at it made me miserable. Samuel Rogers, Esquire, sworn, examined by Mr. Attorney-General. Question. You know Mr. William Stone? Answer. Yes. Question. Do you know Mr. Hereford Stone? Answer. I have known him many years. Question. Do you recollect having any conversation? And if you do, be so good as state to my lord and the jury what conversation you had with Mr. William Stone relative to an invasion of this country? Answer. He met me, I think it was in the month of March 1794, in the street. He stopped me to mention the receipt of a letter from his brother at Paris on the arrival of a gentleman who wished particularly to collect the sentiments of the people of this country with respect to a French invasion. Our conversation went very little further, for it was in the street. Question. Do you recollect what you said to him, if you said anything? Answer. I recollect that I rather declined the conversation. Question. I ask you not what you declined or did not decline, but what you said to him if you said anything. Answer. I was in a hurry, and I believe all I said was to decline the conversation. Question. State in what language you did decline the conversation. Answer. I said that I had no wish to take any part whatever in any political transactions at that time. It was a time of general alarm, and I wished to shun even the shadow of an imputation, as I knew that when the minds of men were agitated, as I thought they then were, the most innocent intentions were liable to misconstruction. Question. Did he inform you who the person was? Answer. No, he did not. I only learned that it was a gentleman arrived from Paris. I speak from recollection. Question. Did he inform you what gentleman he was? Answer. I do not recollect that he did. Question. Did he ever call upon you after you had declined this conversation? Answer. He did call upon me a few days after, and he read to me a paper which I understood to be written by somebody else, but I cannot say who and which went to show, as far as I can recollect, that the English nation, however they might differ among themselves, would unite to repel an invasion. If you wish to have your works coldly reviewed, get your intimate friends to write an article on them. I know this from experience. 
Ward, Lord Dudley, cut up my Columbus in the quarterly, but he afterwards repented of it and apologised to me. I have seen Howard the philanthropist more than once. He was a remarkably mild-looking man. His book on prisons is excellently written. People are not aware that Dr. Price wrote a portion of it. Sir Henry Englefield had a fancy, which some greater men have had, that there was about his person a natural odour of roses and violets. Lady Grenville, hearing of this and loving a joke, exclaimed one day when Sir Henry was present, Bless me, what a smell of violets! Yes, said he with great simplicity, it comes from me. End of section 10section 11 of reminiscences and table talk of samuel rogers this librivox recording is in the public domain in former days creep's pictures were comparatively little valued he was the first artist who painted light and therefore he was not understood sir william beechey was at a picture sale with wilson when one of coop's pictures was knocked down for a trifling sum well, said Wilson, the day will come when both Coop's works and my own will bring the prices which they ought to bring. Sir Thomas Lawrence used to say that among painters there were three preeminent for invention, Giorgione, Rembrandt and Rubens. And perhaps he was right. Sir Thomas Lawrence has painted several very pleasing pictures of children, but generally his men are effeminate and his women meretricious. Of his early portrait, Sir Joshua Reynolds said, This young man has a great deal of talent, but there is an affectation in his style which he will never entirely shake off. We have now in England a greater number of tolerably good painters than ever existed here together in any former period. But alas, we have no Hogarth and no Reynolds. I must not, however, forget that we have Turner, a man of first-rate genius in his line. There is in some of his pictures a grandeur which neither Cloud nor Poussin could give to theirs. Turner thinks that Rubens's landscapes are deficient in nature. I differ from him. Indeed, there, in square brackets, on the wall of Mr. Rogers's dining-room, is a proof that he is mistaken. Look at that forest scene by rubens the foreground of it is truth itself the art union is a perfect curse it buys and engraves very inferior pictures and consequently encourages mediocrity of talent it makes young men who have no genius abandon the desk and counter and set up for painters the public gave little encouragement to flaxman and banks but showered its patronage on two much inferior sculptors, Bacon and Chantry. And as to Flaxman, the greatest sculptor of his day, the neglect which he experienced as something inconceivable. Canova, who was well acquainted with his exquisite illustrations of Dante, etc., could hardly believe that a man of such genius was not an object of admiration amongst his countrymen, and in allusion to their insensibility to Flaxman's merits and to their patronage of inferior artists, he said to some of the English at Rome, You see with your ears. Chantry began his career by being a carver in wood. The ornaments on that mahogany sideboard and on that stand, in square brackets, in Mr. Rogers's dining room, were carved by him. Footnote subsequently when a gentleman informed mr rogers that the truth of this last statement had been questioned he entered into the following particulars chantry said to me one day do you recollect that about twenty-five years ago a journeyman came to your house from the wood carver employed by you and mr hope to talk about these ornaments and that you gave him a drawing to execute them by i replied that i recollected it perfectly well, continued Chantry, I was that journeyman. End of footnote. 
when he was at rome in the height of his celebrity he injured himself not a little by talking with contempt of the finest statues of antiquity jackson the painter told me that he and chantry went into the studio of dunnecker the sculptor who happened to be from home there was an unfinished bust in the room and chantry taking up a chisel proceeded to work upon it one of the assistants immediately rushed forwards in great alarm to stop him but no sooner had chantry given a blow on the chisel than the man exclaimed with a knowing look ha ha as much as to say i see that you perfectly understand what you are about chantry practised portrait painting both at sheffield and after he came to london it was in allusion to him that lawrence said a broken-down painter will make a very good sculptor otley's knowledge of painting was astonishing showing him a picture which i had just received from italy i said whose work do you suppose it to be after looking at it attentively he replied it is the work of lorenzo de credi by whom i already knew that it was painted how i asked could you discover it to be from lorenzo's pencil have you ever before now seen any of his pieces never he answered but i am familiar with the description of his style as given by vasari and others i regret that so little of curran's brilliant talk has been preserved how much of it Tom Moore could record if he would only take the trouble? I once dined with Curran in the public room of the chief inn at Greenwich, when he talked a great deal, and as usual, with considerable exaggeration, speaking of something which he would not do on any inducement, he exclaimed vehemently, I had rather be hanged upon twenty gibbets. Don't you think, sir, that one would be enough for you? said a girl a stranger who was sitting at the table next to us i wish you could have seen curran's face he was absolutely confounded struck dumb very few persons know that the poem called ulm and trafalgar was written by canning he composed it as george ellis told me in about two days while he walked up and down the room indeed very few persons know that such a poem exists after legg was appointed bishop of oxford he had the folly to ask two wits canning and freer to be present at his first sermon well said he to canning how did you like it oh, i thought it was rather short oh yes i am aware that it was short but i was afraid of being tedious you were tedious a lady having put to canning the silly question why have they made the spaces in the iron gate at spring gardens so narrow he replied oh ma'am because such very fat people used to go through a reply concerning which tom moore said that the person who does not relish it can have no perception of real wit canning said that a man who could talk of liking dry champagne would not scruple to say anything the duke of york told me that dr cyril jackson most conscientiously did his duty as tutor to himself and his brother the prince of wales jackson said the duke used to have a silver pencil case in his hand while we were at our lessons and he has frequently given us such knocks with it upon our foreheads that the blood followed them i have often heard the duke relate how he and his brother george when young men were robbed by footpads on hay hill they had dined that day at devonshire house had then gone home to lay aside their court dresses and afterwards proceeded to a house of a certain description in the neighbourhood of berkeley square they were returning from it in a hackney coach late at night when some footpads stopped them on hay hill and carried off their purses watches etc in his earlier days the duke of york was most exact in paying all his debts of honour one night at brooks's while he was playing cards he said to lord thanet who was about to go home to bed lord thanet is our betting still to continue yes sir certainly was the reply 
and next morning lord dunnett found fifteen hundred pounds left for him at brooks's by the duke but gradually he became less particular in such matters and at last he would quietly pocket the winnings of the night from lord robert spencer though he owed lord robert about five thousand pounds i have several times stayed at oatlands with the duke and duchess of york both of them most amiable and agreeable persons we were generally a company of about fifteen and our being invited to remain there another day sometimes depended on the ability of our royal host and his hostess to raise sufficient money for our entertainment we used to have all sorts of ridiculous fun as we roamed about the grounds the duchess kept besides a number of dogs for which there was a regular burial place a collection of monkeys each of which had its own pole with a house at top one of the visitors whose name i forget would single out a particular monkey and play to it on the fiddle with such fury and perseverance that the poor animal half distracted would at last take refuge in the arms of lord alvanley monk lewis was a great favourite at oatlands one day after dinner as the duchess was leaving the room she whispered something into lewis's ear he was much affected his eyes filling with tears we asked what was the matter ah oh, replied lewis the duchess spoke so very kindly to me my dear fellow said colonel armstrong pray don't cry i dare say she didn't mean it End of section eleven. Section twelve of Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Monk Lewis's writings, there is a deal of bad taste, but still he was a man of genius. I tell you two stories which he was very fond of repeating and which Wyndham used to like. The first is The Skeleton in the Church Porch. Some travellers were supping at an inn in Germany and sent for the landlord to give them a glass of wine. In the course of conversation, the landlord remarked that a certain person whom they happened to speak of was as obstinate as the skeleton in the church porch. What is that? they inquired the landlord said that he alluded to a skeleton which it was impossible to keep underground that he had twice or thrice assisted in laying it in the charnel but that always the day after it had been buried it was found lying in the church porch the travellers were greatly struck by this account and they expressed an eager desire to see the refractory skeleton at last a young serving-woman coming into the room they asked her if she for a reward would go to the church porch and bring the skeleton to them she at first refused to do so but eventually the travellers offered a sum of money which she could not resist be it particularly observed that the young woman was then big with child well off she went to the church and having found the skeleton in its usual place she brought it to the inn on her back and laid it upon the table before the travellers they had no sooner looked at it than they wished it gone and they prevailed on the young woman for another sum of money to carry it again to the church porch when she arrived there she set it down and turning away she was proceeding quickly upon the path which led from the church and which was seen stretching out before her in the clear moonlight when suddenly she felt the skeleton leap upon her back she tried to shake it off but in vain she then fell on her knees and said her prayers the skeleton relaxed its hold and she again rushed down the path when as before the skeleton leapt upon her back i will never quit you it said till you descend into the charnel and obtain forgiveness for the skeleton that lies in the church porch she paused a moment then summoning up her courage replied that she would do so the skeleton dropped off down she went into the charnel and after groping about for some time she perceived the pale figure of a lady sitting by a lamp and reading 
she advanced towards the figure and kneeling said i ask forgiveness for the skeleton that lies in the church porch the lady read on without looking at her again she repeated her supplication but still the lady read on regardless of it the young woman then ascended from the channel and was running down the path when the skeleton once more arrested her progress i will never quit you it said to do obtain forgiveness for the skeleton that lies in the church porch go again into the channel and ask it again the young woman descended and advancing to the lady sunk upon her knees and cried i come a second time to ask forgiveness for the skeleton that lies in the church porch i grant that forgiveness the skeleton implores it i implore it the babe that i bear in my womb implores it also the lady turned her head towards the speaker gave a faint smile and disappeared on coming up from the channel the young woman found the skeleton standing erect in the porch i am now here it said not to trouble you but to thank you you have at length procured me rest in the grave i was betrothed to the lady whom you saw in the channel and i basely deserted her for another i stood at the altar about to be married to my second love when suddenly the lady rushed into the church and having stabbed herself with a dagger said to me as she was expiring you shall never have rest in the grave no never till the babe unborn shall ask forgiveness for you the skeleton rewarded the good offices of the young woman by discovering to her the place where a heap of treasure was concealed the second story is lord hart's rat tom sheridan was shooting on the moors in ireland and lost his dog a day or two after it made its appearance following an irish labourer it was restored to sheridan who remarked to the labourer that the dog seemed very familiar with him the answer was yes it follows me as the rat did lord hart an inquiry about this rat drew forth what is now to be told lord howth having dissipated his property retired in very low spirits to a lonely chateau on the sea coast one stormy night a vessel was seen to go down and next morning a raft was beheld floating towards the shore as it approached the bystanders were surprised to find that it was guided by a lady who presently stepped upon the beach she was exquisitely beautiful but they were unable to discover who or what she was for she spoke in an unknown tongue lord howth was struck with great pity for this fair stranger and conducted her to his shadow there she remained a considerable time when he became violently enamoured of her and at last asked her to become his wife she having now learned the english language thanked him for the honour he intended for her but declared in the most positive terms that she could never be his she then earnestly advised him to marry a certain lady of a neighbouring county he followed her advice paid his addresses to the lady and was accepted before the marriage the beautiful stranger took a ribbon from her hair and binding it round the wrist of lord howth said your happiness depends on your never parting with this ribbon he assured her that it should remain constantly on his wrist she then disappeared and was never seen again the marriage took place the ribbon was a matter of much wonder and curiosity to the bride and one night while lord howth was asleep she removed it from his wrist and carried it to the fire that she might read the characters inscribed upon it accidentally she let the flame reach it and it was consumed some time after lord howth was giving a grand banquet in his hall when the company was suddenly disturbed by the barking of dogs this the servant said was occasioned by a rat which the dogs were pursuing 
Presently the rat, followed by the dogs, entered the hall. It mounted on the table, and running up to Lord Howth, stared at him earnestly with its bright black eyes. He saved its life. From that moment it never quitted him. Wherever he was, alone or with his friends, there was the rat. At last the society of the rat became very disagreeable to Lord Howth, and his brother urged him to leave Ireland for a time that he might get rid of it. He did so, and proceeded to Marseille, accompanied by his brother. They had just arrived at that place, and were sitting in the room of an hotel, when the door opened, and in came the rat. It was dripping wet, and went straight to the fire to dry itself. Lord Hout's brother, greatly enraged at the intrusion, seized the poker and dashed out its brains. "'You have murdered me,' cried Lord Howth, and instantly expired. End of section 12section thirteen of reminiscences and table talk of samuel rogers this librivox recording is in the public domain at one of lady crewe's dinner parties grattan after talking very delightfully for some time all at once seemed disconcerted and sunk into silence i asked his daughter who was sitting next to me the reason of this huh, she replied He's just found out that he's come here in his powdering coat. Grattan said that Malone went about looking through strongly magnifying spectacles for pieces of straw and bits of broken glass. He used to talk with admiration of the French translation of Demosthenes by Auger. He thought it the best of all translations. He declared that the two greatest men of modern times were William the Third and Washington. Three persons, said Grattan, are considered as having the best claim to the authorship of Junius's letters. Gibbon, Hamilton and Burke. Gibbon is out of the question. I do not believe that they were Hamilton's, because a man who was willing to be known as the author of a bad piece but hardly have failed to acknowledge that he had written an excellent book. I incline to think that Burke was Junius. Burke, observed Grattan, became at last such an enthusiastic admirer of kingly power that he could not have slept comfortably on his pillow if he had not thought that the king had a right to carry it off from under his head. Do you ever say your prayers? asked Plunkett of Grattan. No, never. What? Never? Neither night nor morning? Never, but I have aspirations all day and all night long. What you have just mentioned, said one of Grattan's friends to him, is a profound secret. Where could you have heard it? Grattan replied, Where secrets are kept? in the street. You remember the passage in my human life, a walk in spring, Grattan, like those with thee by the heath side, who had not envied me, when the sweet lime so full of bees in June led us to meet beneath their boughs at noon, and thou didst say which of the great and wise could they but hear, and at thy bidding rise, thou wouldst call up and question. I allude to some lime trees near Tunbridge Wells. Grattan would say to me, Come, Rogers, let's take a walk among the lime trees and hear those great senators, the bees. And while we were listening to their buzzing and humming, he would exclaim, Now they're holding a committee, etc., etc. He would say to, Were I a necromancer, I should like to call up Scipio Africanus. He was not so skilful a captain as Hannibal, but he was a greater and more virtuous man. And I should like to talk to Julius Caesar on several points of his history. On one particularly, though I would not press the subject if disagreeable to him, 
I should wish to know what part he took during Catiline's conspiracy. Should you like to call up Cleopatra? I asked. No, replied Grattan, not Cleopatra. She would tell me nothing but lies, and her beauty would make me sad. Footnote. The very reverse of the effect which the beauty of the little cottage girl produced on Wordsworth, quote, her beauty made me glad. We are seven. Speaking to me of the poem just cited, Wordsworth said, it is founded on fact. I met a little girl near Godrich Castle who, though some of her brothers and sisters were dead, would talk of them in the present tense. I wrote that poem backward. That is, I began with the last stanza. End of footnote. Grattan was so fond of walking with me that Mrs. Grattan once said to him rather angrily, You'll be taken for Mr. Rogers's shadow. How I should like, said Grattan one day to me, to spend my whole life in a small, neat cottage. I could be content with very little. I should need only cold meat and bread and beer and plenty of claret. I once said to Grattan, if you were now only twenty years old and Cook were about to set sail round the world, should you like to accompany him? He answered, I have no wish to see such countries as he saw. I should like to see Rome, Athens and some parts of Asia, but little besides. He declared that he had rather be shot than go up in a balloon. Grattan's uncle, Dean Marley, gave the nicest little dinners and kept the best company in Dublin. His parties were delightful. At that time he had about four hundred a year. Afterwards, when he had succeeded to an estate and was made a bishop, he gave great dinners, chiefly to people of rank and fashion, foolish men and foolish women, and his parties lost all their charm. He in square brackets, Marley, had a good deal of the humour of Swift. Once, when the footman was out of the way, he ordered the coachman to fetch some water from the well. To this, the coachman objected that his business was to drive, not to run on errands. Well then, said Marley, bring out the coach and four, set the pitcher inside, and drive to the well. A service which was several times repeated to the great amusement of the village. Grattan, entering a cottage with a hat in his hand, Sir, you're most obedient. Now, sir, how much may you earn in a week? You eat little or no meat, I suppose? Anxious to confute Forster, who had said that cottages about Tunbridge lived worse than those in Ireland. Like Louis the Fourteenth, he returns the bow of a child. Readers note sayings of Grattan. One of the reasons why the affairs of nations are not better conducted is that the consequences of our misconduct is more remote and less certain than any false step we may make in private life. A nation may be ruined, but not in our time, nor will the causes that led to it be so obvious as to attach certainly to such or such a person. We may not live to see the tragedy, nor indeed may it ever take place. Our self-interest in that respect is therefore less awake, and so also are our consciences. Nor is our imagination so excited by the prospect of evil to many as to one. Our self-interest as individuals, which is generally short-sighted, counteracts the other too powerfully. Were I rich and could live as I please, I should have no wish for a fine house or fine furniture. I would rather not have them. I should be afraid of hurting them. Or pictures. They give me no pleasure. I would have no fine gardens or conservatories. I love the fruit. But I would have no fine gardener to criticise me and tell me I was doing wrong or walking awkwardly. I should love a wide expanse. 
I would have bands of music. I love music. I would have a carriage for use and fine horses, but not for riding. I love to go fast. I would cut the air. Wealth makes a man sad. He lives for others who don't care for him. He becomes a steward. I cannot bear large and mixed companies. They make me miserable. In square brackets, Mrs. G complains that he ought to bear his share in them, but he won't. He has no voice for them. Samuel Rogers, close square brackets. Lord Bullingbrook, a very fine speaker, and therefore banished the house. His dedication to his dissertations on parties, a very fine imitation of that to killing no murder. A fine prospect to the visitor or traveller is ever delightful, but possession destroys the pleasure. If I delighted much in a view or a spot, I would wish some other person to live there. Pitt's faults might arise in some degree from his situation. For twenty years he was an apologist for failure and an imposer of taxes. In other words... A humbug. Burke's speeches are far better to read than to hear. They are better suited to a patient reader than to an impatient hearer. Mrs. Anne Pitt, Lord Chatham's sister, a very superior woman. She hated him, and they lived like dog and cat. She said he had never read but one book, The Fairy Queen. He could only get rid of her by leaving his house and setting a bill upon it, this house to let. Every sentence, in square brackets, of Fox, came rolling like a wave of the Atlantic, three thousand miles long. Stella, footnote Mrs. Johnson, whom Swift had celebrated under the name of Stella, used often to visit my aunt and sleep with her in the same bed, and weep all night. She was not very handsome. Miss V. Dash was handsome. Footnote Miss Van Hom Rye, whom Swift called Vanessa. Who was the best speaker you ever heard? Fox during the American War. Fox in his best days, about the year 1779. Using the word disloyalty in the sense it has been used in makes the king the law. Lord Chatham, quote, Don't inquire from what quarter the wind cometh, but whither it goeth. And if any measure that comes from the right honourable gentleman tends to the public good, my bark is ready. Quote, I stand alone. I stand like our first ancestor, naked, but not ashamed. Lord Chatham, I think, delivered finer things than Demosthenes, but he had a greater theatre, and men are made by circumstances. Quote, America has resisted. I rejoice, my lords. Footnote. Quote, the gentleman tells us America is obstinate. America is almost in open rebellion. I rejoice that America has resisted. Three millions of people so dead to all feelings of liberty as voluntarily to submit to be slaves would have been fit instruments to make slaves of the rest. End footnote. This passage, I think, excels any in Demosthenes. I was in Paris in 1771 for three months and delighted, though I made no acquaintance but with an abbe and a swindler. I went with two other Templars to study in France by Havre, taking coke upon Littleton, but settled nowhere. Solitude is bad. I have tried Tinhinch for twenty years. Reader's note, Grattan's house in Ireland. It leads to melancholy, to a sort of madness. You think of your vexations, your age. Society should always be in your power. 
an old man cannot enjoy solitude he has learnt the secret he has found out the rogueries of fortune nor will reading supply the want i would live in a house full of society to which i might escape from myself i was called the spirit of the dargle footnote a glen near tinahinch i found out he said laughing that a man's worst companion is himself the king charles i had made war on the people but the death of strafford was less to be justified though a thief a robber he was no traitor he had committed every crime but that for which he was condemned to die of what use is it lycidas says johnson footnote see johnson's criticism of lycidas in his life of milton where he speaks of it as without nature and without truth its diction as harsh its numbers as unpleasing its images long ago exhausted and its form as that of a pastoral easy vulgar and therefore disgusting End of footnote. these things they take the mind out of the dirt as it were the french poets i read with little pleasure and am glad when i have done wallow perhaps but such is their homage to the great we are the worse for them a wife should be of a modest character she should sing burke's best things on the payment of the nabob of arcot's debts descent of hyder ali on the carnatic he was heard without much attention we should always have the appearance of narrative not of description dislikes the clergy and all humbugs in square back at samuel rogers his forte in conversation is sketching a character with a gentle voice and many pauses but with a delicate irony a great archness of look and manner beginning as you would think with something like praise and ending with a roll of the person and a turn of the head in a coup de patte it is very delightful to see him with miss fox the enjoyment she feels encourages him end samuel rogers end square brackets pitt would be right nineteen times for once that fox would be right for that once will be worth all the rest the heart is wiser than the schools in conversation said plunkett he gave results rather than processes of reasoning every sentence was a treasure when dr lucas a very unpopular man ventured on a speech in the irish parliament and failed altogether grattan said he rose without a friend and sat down without an enemy of dash he said he was a coward in the field and a bully in the street end of section 13section fourteen of reminiscences and table talk of samuel rogers this librivox recording is in the public domain archibald hamilton afterwards duke of hamilton as his daughter lady dunmore told me advertised for a hermit as an ornament to his pleasure grounds and was stipulated that the said hermit should have his beard shaved but once a year and that only partially a friend calling on him one forenoon asked if it was true that he kept a young tame tiger he immediately slapped his thighs and uttered a sort of whistle and forth crept the long-backed animal from under the sofa the visitor soon retreated lord shelburne could say the most provoking things and yet appear quite unconscious of their being so in one of his speeches alluding to lord carlyle he said the noble lord has written a comedy no a tragedy in square brackets the father's revenge oh i beg pardon i thought it was a comedy 
I know few lines finer than the concluding stanza of Life by Mrs. Barbold, who composed it when she was very old. Life, we have been long together, through pleasant and through cloudy weather. Tis hard to part when friends are dear. Perhaps it will cost a sigh, a tear, then steal away, give little warning, choose thine own time. Say not good night, but in some brighter clime bid me good morning. Sitting with Madame D'Arblay some weeks before she died, I said to her, Do you remember those lines of Mrs. Barbold's life, which I once repeated to you? Remember them, she replied. I repeat them to myself every night before I go to sleep. Strangely enough, in spite of her correct taste, Mrs. Barbold was quite fascinated by Darwin's Botanic Garden when it first appeared, and talked of it with rapture, for which I scolded her heartily. One day, as she was going to Hampstead in the stagecoach, she had a Frenchman for her companion, and entering into conversation with him, she found that he was making an excursion to Hampstead for the express purpose of seeing the house in the flask walk where Clarissa Harlow lodged. What a compliment to the genius of Richardson! Bobus Smith, who could repeat by heart an astonishing quantity of Latin prose, used to admire greatly the raptor largitor of Tacitus. I am inclined to prefer Sallust's expression, alieni apetens sui profusus. A few days before his death, Bobus said to me, Rogers, however we may doubt on some points, we have made up our minds on one, that Christ was sent into the world, commissioned by the Almighty, to instruct mankind. I replied, yes, of that I am perfectly convinced. When I was a lad, I recollect seeing a whole cart full of young girls in dresses of various colours on their way to be executed at Tyburn. They had all been condemned on one indictment, for having been concerned in, that is, perhaps, for having been spectators of, the burning of some houses during Lord George Gordon's riots. It was quite horrible. Greville was present at one of the trials consequent on those riots, and heard several boys sentenced to their own excessive amazement to be hanged. Never, said Greville with great naivety, did I see boys cry so? Sir Thomas Lawrence told me that when he in his boyhood had received a prize from the Society of Arts, he went with it into the parlour where his brothers and sisters were sitting, but that not one of them would take the slightest notice of it, and that he was so mortified by their affected indifference that he ran upstairs to his own room and burst into tears. On coming home late one night, I found Sir Thomas Lawrence in the street, hovering about my door and waiting for my return. He immediately began the tale of his distress, telling me that he was in pressing need of a large sum of money, and that he depended on my assistance, being sure that I would not like to see the President of the Royal Academy a bankrupt. I replied that I would try what I could do for him next morning. Accordingly, I went early to Lord Dudley. As you, I said, can command thousands and thousands of pounds, and have a truly feeling heart, I want you to help a friend of mine, not, however, as a gift, but either by a loan, or by purchasing some valuable articles which he has to sell. Dudley, on learning the particulars, accompanied me to Sir Thomas's house, where we looked at several pictures which he wished to dispose of in order to meet the present difficulty. Most of them were early pictures of the Italian school, and though valuable, not pleasing, perhaps, to any except artists. Dudley bought one of them, a Raphael in his first style, as it was called, and probably was, giving, I believe, more than a thousand guineas for it, and he lent Sir Thomas, on a bond, a very considerable sum besides. No doubt, if Lawrence had lived, he would have repaid Lord Dudley by instalments, 
but he died soon after, and not a penny was ever paid back. This, to so very wealthy a man as Dudley, was of no consequence, and I dare say he never thought about it at all. Sir Thomas, at the time of his death, was a good deal in my debt, nor was I ever repaid. He used to purchase works of art, especially drawings of the old masters, at immense prices. He was careless in keeping accounts, and he was very generous. Hence his difficulties, which were every now and then occurring. Mrs. Siddons told me that one night, as she stepped into her carriage to return home from the theatre, Sheridan suddenly jumped in after her. Mr. Sheridan, she said, I trust you will behave with all propriety. If you do not, I shall immediately let down the glass and desire the servant to show you out. Sheridan did behave with all propriety. But, continued Mrs. Siddons, as soon as we had reached my house in Marlborough Street and the footman had opened the carriage door, only think, the provoking wretch bolted out in the greatest haste and slunk away, as if anxious to escape unseen. After she had left the stage, Mrs. Siddons, from the want of excitement, was never happy. When I was sitting with her of an afternoon, she would say, Oh dear, this is the time I used to be thinking of going to the theatre. First came the pleasure of dressing for my part, and then the pleasure of acting it, but that is all over now. When a grand public dinner was given to John Kemble on his quitting the stage, Mrs. Siddons said to me, well, perhaps in the next world women will be more valued than they are in this. She alluded to the comparatively little sensation which had been produced by her own retirement from the boards. And doubtless she was a far, far greater performer than John Kemble. Whom recollected having seen Mrs. Siddons when a very young woman, standing by the side of her father's stage and knocking a pair of snuffers against a candlestick to imitate the sound of a windmill during the representation of some harlequin piece. John Campbell was often very amusing when he'd had a good deal of wine. He and two friends were returning to town in an open carriage from the Priory, Lord Abercorn's, where they had dined. And as they were waiting for change at a toll-gate, Kemble, to the amazement of the toll-keeper, called out in the tone of Roller, We seek no change, and least of all such change as he would bring us. When Kemble was living at Lausanne, he used to feel rather jealous of Mont Blanc. He disliked to hear people always asking, How does Mont Blanc look this morning? Sir George Beaumont, when a young man, was introduced at Rome to an old painter who in his youth had known an old painter who had seen Claude and Caspar Poussin riding out in a morning on mules and furnished with pallets, etc., to make sketches in the Campagna. Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire, was not so beautiful as she was fascinating. Her beauty was not that of features, but of expression. Everybody knows her poem, Mount St. Gotthard. She wrote also what is much less known, a novel called The Silk. Gaming was the rage during her day. She indulged in it and was made miserable by her debts. A faro table was kept by Martindale at which the Duchess and other high fashionables used to play. Sheridan said that the Duchess and Martindale had agreed that Whatever they two, one from each other, should be sometimes double, sometimes treble, the sum which it was called. And Sheridan assured me that he had handed the Duchess into her carriage when she was literally sobbing at her losses. She perhaps, having lost fifteen hundred pounds, when it was supposed to be only five hundred pounds. General Fitzpatrick said that the Duke's love for her grew quite cool a month after their marriage, that she had many sighing swains at her feet, among others the Prince of Wales, 
who chose to believe that she smiled upon Lord Grey, and hence the hatred which the Prince bore to him. The Duke, when walking home from Brooks's about daybreak, for he did not relish the gaieties at Devonshire House, used frequently to pass the stall of a cobbler who had already commenced his work. As they were the only persons stirring in that quarter, they always saluted each other. Good night, friend, said the Duke. Good morning, sir, said the cobbler. The Duchess was dreadfully hurt at the novel of Winter in London. It contained various anecdotes concerning her which had been picked up from her confidential attendants. And she thought, of course, that the little great world in which she lived was intimately acquainted with all her proceedings. Never read that book, for it has helped to kill me, were her words to a very near relative. End of section 14section 15 of reminiscences and table talk of samuel rogers this librivox recording is in the public domain would note this letter and the following anecdote were communicated by mr rogers to sir walter scott's son-in-law john lockhart february 1834 my dear sir you asked me not long ago if i could recall any of his in square brackets walter scott's conversation happy should i be if i could but with a single exception i can only remember generally the charm which he threw around him wherever he came that exception is however at your service sitting one day alone with him in your house it was the day but one before he left it to embark at portsmouth for malta i led him among other things to tell me once again a story of himself which he had formerly told me and which i had often wished to recover when i returned home i wrote it down as nearly as i could in his own words and here they are the subject is an achievement worthy of ulysses himself and such as many of his schoolfellows could no doubt have related of him but i fear i have done it no justice though the story is so very characteristic that it should not be lost the inimitable manner in which he told it the glance of the eye the turn of the head and the light that played over his faded features as one by one the circumstances came back to him accompanied by a thousand boyish feelings that had slept perhaps for years these no language not even his own could convey to you but you can supply them would that others could do so who had not the good fortune to know him samuel rogers Quote, there was a boy in my class at school who stood always at the top nor could i with all my efforts supplant him day passed after day and still he kept his place do what i would till at length i observed that when a question was asked him he always fumbled with his fingers at a particular button in the lower part of his waistcoat to remove it therefore became expedient in my eyes and in an evil moment it was removed with a knife great was my anxiety to know the success of my measure and it succeeded too well when the boy was again questioned his fingers sought again for the button but it was not to be found in his distress he looked down for it it was to be seen no more than to be felt he stood confounded and i took possession of his place nor did he ever recover it or ever i believe suspect who was the author of his wrong often in after life has the sight of him smote me as i passed by him and often have i resolved to make him some reparation but it ended in good resolutions though i never renewed my acquaintance with him i often saw him for he filled some inferior office in one of the courts of law at edinburgh poor fellow he took early to drinking and i believe he is dead unquote. friday october the twenty first eighteen thirty one i introduced sir walter scott to madame d'arblay having taken him with me to her house 
she had not heard that he was lame and when he limped towards a chair she said dear me sir walter i hope you have not met with an accident he answered an accident madam nearly as old as my birth at the time when scott and byron were the two lions of london hookham freer observed great poets formerly homer and milton were blind now they are lame one forenoon scott was sitting for his bust to chantry he was in despair at the dull and heavy expression of his countenance suddenly fuller jack fuller the then buffoon of the house of commons was announced by a servant and as suddenly scott's face was lighted up to that pitch of animation which the sculptor desired and which he made all haste to avail himself of after dining at my house sir walter then mr scott accompanied me to a party given by lady jersey we met sheridan there who put the question to scott in express terms pray mr scott did you or did you not write waverley scott replied on my honour i did not now though scott may perhaps be justified for returning an answer in the negative i cannot think that he is to be excused for strengthening it with on my honour when i lived in the temple mackintosh and richard sharp used to come to my chambers and stay there for hours talking metaphysics one day they were so intent on their first cause spirit and matter that they were unconscious of my having left them paid a visit and returned i was a little angry at this but to show my indifference about them i sat down and wrote letters without taking any notice of them mackintosh told me that he had received in his youth comparatively little instruction whatever learning he possessed he owed to himself he had a prodigious memory and could repeat by heart more of cicero than you would easily believe his knowledge of greek was slender i never met a man with a fuller mind than mackintosh such readiness on all subjects such a talker lord ellenborough had infinite wit when the income tax was imposed he said that lord kenyon who was not very nice in his habits intended in consequence of it to lay down his pocket handkerchief a lawyer one day pleading before him and using several times the expression my unfortunate client lord ellenborough suddenly interrupted him there sir the court is with you lord ellenborough was once about to go on the circuit when lady e said that she should like to accompany him he replied that he had no objections provided she did not encumber the carriage with bandboxes which were his utter abhorrence they set off during the first day's journey lord ellenborough happening to stretch his legs struck his feet against something below the seat he discovered that it was a bandbox his indignation is not to be described up went the window and out went the bandbox the coachman stopped and the footman thinking that the bandbox had tumbled out of the window by some extraordinary chance were going to pick it up when lord ellenborough furiously called out drive on the bandbox accordingly was left by a ditch side having reached the county town where he was to officiate as judge lord ellenborough proceeded to array himself for his appearance in the courthouse now he said where's my wig where is my wig my lord replied his attendant it was thrown out of the carriage window the english highwaymen of former days indeed the race is now extinct were remarkably well-bred personages thomas grenville while travelling with lord derby and lord tankerville while travelling with his father were attacked by highwaymen on both occasions six or seven shots were exchanged between them and the highwaymen 
and when the parties assailed had expended all their ammunition, the highwaymen came up to them and took their purses in the politest manner possible. One morning I had a visit from Lancaster, whom I had never before seen. The moment he entered the room, he began to inform me of his distresses and burst into tears. He was unable, he said, to carry on his school for want of money. He owed some hundred pounds to his landlord. He had been to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who would do nothing for him, etc., etc. And he requested me to go and see his school. I went, and was so delighted with what I saw, the system of monitors, etc., that I immediately lent him the sum which he stood in need of, and he put his title deeds into my hands. I never was repaid one farthing of that money. Indeed, on finding that Lancaster owed much larger sums both to William Allen and to Joseph Fox, I forbore urging my claims and returned the title deeds. George Selwyn, as everybody knows, delighted in seeing executions. He never missed being in at a death at Tyburn. When Lord Holland, the father of Charles Fox, was confined to bed by a dangerous illness, he was informed by his servant that Mr. Selwyn had recently called to inquire for him. On his next visit, said Lord Holland, be sure you let him in, whether I am alive or a corpse. For if I am alive, I shall have great pleasure in seeing him, and if I am a corpse, he will have great pleasure in seeing me. The late Lord Holland told me this. Payne Knight was seized with an utter loathing of life, and destroyed himself. He had complaints which were very painful, and his nerves were completely shattered. Shortly before his death he would come to me of an evening, and tell me how sick he was of existence. He had recourse to the strongest prussic acid, and I understand he was dead before it touched his lips. Coleridge was a marvellous talker. One morning, when Hook and Freer also breakfasted with me, Coleridge talked for three hours without intermission about poetry, and so admirably that I wish every word he uttered had been written down. Sometimes his harangues were quite unintelligible, not only to myself, but to others. Wordsworth and I called upon him one forenoon when he was lodging off Pall Mall. He talked uninterruptedly for about two hours, during which Wordsworth listened to him with profound attention, every now and then nodding his head as if in assent. On quitting the lodging, I said to Wordsworth, well, for my own part, I could not make head or tail of Coleridge's oration. Pray, did you understand it? Not one syllable of it, was Wordsworth's reply. Footnote. Wordsworth once observed to me, quote, What is somewhere stated in print that I said Coleridge was the only person whose intellect ever astonished me is quite true. His conversation was even finer in his youth than in his later days, for as he advanced in life he became a little dreamy and hyper-metaphysical. Unquote. End of footnote. Speaking of composition, Coleridge said most beautifully, What comes from the heart goes to the heart. Coleridge spoke and wrote very disparagingly of Mackintosh, but Mackintosh, who had not a particle of envy or jealousy in his nature, did full justice on all occasions to the great powers of Coleridge. Southey used to say that the moment anything assumed the shape of a duty, Coleridge felt himself incapable of discharging it. In all his domestic relations, Southey was the most amiable of men, but he had no general philanthropy. He was what you call a cold man. He was never happy except when reading a book or making one. Coleridge once said to me, I can't think of Southey without seeing him either mending or using a pen. 
I spent some time with him at Lord Lonsdale's in company with Wordsworth and others, and while the rest of the party were walking about, talking and amusing themselves, Southey preferred sitting solus in the library. How cold he is, was the exclamation of Wordsworth, himself so joyous and communicative. Southey told me that he had read Spencer through about thirty times, and that he could not read Pope through once. He thought meanly of Virgil, so did Coleridge, and so at one time did Wordsworth. When I lately mentioned to Wordsworth an unfavourable opinion which he had formerly expressed to me about a passage of Virgil, oh, he said, we used to talk a great deal of nonsense in those days. Early in the present century I set out on a tour in Scotland accompanied by my sister, but an accident which happened to have prevented us from going as far as we had intended. During our excursion we fell in with Wordsworth, Miss Wordsworth and Coleridge, who were at the same time making a tour in a vehicle that looked very like a cart. Wordsworth and Coleridge were entirely occupied in talking about poetry and the whole care of looking out for cottages where they might get refreshment and pass the night, as well as of seeing their poor horse fed and littered, devolved upon Miss Wordsworth. She was a most delightful person, so full of talent, so simple-minded and so modest. If I am not mistaken, Coleridge proved so impracticable a travelling companion that Wordsworth and his sister were at last obliged to separate from him. Footnote. Coleridge, writes Wordsworth, was at that time in bad spirits, and somewhat too much in love with his own dejection, and he departed from us, as is recorded in my sister's journal, soon after we left Loch Lomond. Memoirs of Wordsworth. This tour took place in 1803. End of footnote. During that tour they met with Scott, who repeated to them a portion of his then unpublished Lay, which Wordsworth, as might be expected, did not greatly admire. I do indeed regret that Wordsworth has printed only fragments of his sister's journal. It is most excellent and ought to have been published entire. I was walking with Lord Lonsdale on the terrace at Lowther Castle when he said, I wish I could do something for poor Campbell. My rejoinder was, I wish you would do something for poor Wordsworth, who is in such straitened circumstances that he and his family deny themselves animal food several times a week. Lord Lonsdale was the more inclined to assist Wordsworth because the Wordsworth family had been hardly used by the preceding Lord Lonsdale, and he eventually proved one of his kindest friends. What a noble-minded person Lord Lonsdale was! I have received from him in this room hundreds of pounds for the relief of literary men. End of section 15「Section 16 of Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hopner was a painter of decided genius. Some of his portraits are equal to any modern portraits, and his Venus is certainly fine. He had an awful temper, the most spiteful person I ever knew. He and I were members of a club called the Council of Trent, so named from its consisting of thirty, and because on one occasion I was interesting myself about the admission of an artist whom Hopner disliked, Hopner wrote me a letter full of the bitterest reproach. Yet he had his good qualities. He had been a singing boy at Windsor, and consequently was allowed, quote, the run of the royal kitchen. But some time after his marriage, and it was supposed through the ill offices of West, that favour was withdrawn, 
and in order to conceal the matter from his wife, who he knew would be greatly vexed at it, Hockner occasionally, after secretly pocketing a roll to dine upon, would go out for the day, and on his return pretend that he had been dining at Windsor. He and Gifford were the dearest friends in the world, and yet they were continually falling out and abusing each other. One morning Hopner, having had some little domestic quarrel with Mrs. Hopner, exclaimed very vehemently, Is it not a man to be pitied, who has such a wife and such a friend? Meaning Gifford. His wife and daughter were always grumbling, because when he was asked to the Duchess of Blanks or to Lord Blanks, they were not invited also. And he once said to them, I might as well attempt to take the York wagon with me as you. Indeed, society is so constituted in England that it is useless for celebrated artists to think of bringing their families into the highest circles, where themselves are admitted only on account of their genius. Their wives and daughters must be content to remain at home. Gifford was extremely indignant at an article on his translation of Juvenal, which appeared in the Critical Review, and he put forth a very angry answer to it, a large quarto pamphlet. I lent my copy to Byron, and he never returned it. One passage in that pamphlet is curious, because it describes what Gifford was himself eventually to become, a reviewer who is compared to a huge toad sitting under a stone. And besides, the passage is very picturesque. Quote, During my apprenticeship, I enjoyed perhaps as many places as scrub, though I suspect they were not altogether so dignified. The chief of them was that of a planter of cabbages in a bit of ground which my master held near the town. It was the decided opinion of Panurge, that the life of a cabbage planter was the safest and pleasantest in the world. I found it safe enough, I confess, but not altogether pleasant, and therefore took every opportunity of attending to what I liked better, which happened to be watching the actions of insects and reptiles, and among the rest of a huge toad. I never loved toads, but I never molested them, for my mother had early bid me remember that Every living thing had the same maker as myself, and the words always rang in my ears. This toad, then, who had taken up his residence under a hollow stone in a hedge of blind nettles, I used to watch for hours together. It was a lazy, lumpish animal that squatted on its belly and poked up its hideous head with two glazed eyes, precisely like a critical reviewer. In this posture, perfectly satisfied with itself, it would remain as if it were part of the stone which sheltered it, till the cheerful buzzing of some winged insect provoked it to give signs of life. The dead glare of its eyes then brightened into a vivid lustre, and it awkwardly shuffled to the entrance of its cell and opened its detestable mouth to snap the passing fly or honeybee. Since I have marked the manners of the critical reviewers, these passages of my youth have often occurred to me. End of quote. Footnote. An examination of the strictures of the critical reviewers on the translation of Juvenile by W. Gifford Esquire. End of footnote. When the quarterly review was first projected, Gifford sent Hopner to my house with a message requesting me to become a contributor to it, which I declined. That odd being Dr. Monsey, physician to the Royal Hospital Chelsea, used to hide his banknotes in various holes and corners of his house. One evening before going out, he carefully deposited a bundle of them among the coals in the parlour grate where the fire was ready for lighting. Presently, his housekeeper came into the parlour with some of her female friends to have a comfortable cup of tea, and she was in the act of lighting the fire when the doctor luckily returned and rescued his notes. 
a friend of mine who had been intimate with Monsey, assured me that this was fact. Bishop Horsley one day met Monsey in the park. These are dreadful times, said Horsley. Not only do deists abound, but, would you think it, Doctor, some people deny that there is a God. I can tell you, replied Monsey, what is equally strange. Some people believe that there are three. Horsley immediately walked away. An Englishman and a Frenchman having quarrelled, they were to fight a duel. Being both great cowards, they agreed, for their mutual safety, of course, that the duel should take place in a room perfectly dark. The Englishman had to fire first. He groped his way to the hearth, fired up the chimney, and brought down the Frenchman, who had taken refuge there. Humphrey Hoer, the surgeon, was called out, and made his appearance in the field stark naked, to the astonishment of the challenger, who asked him what he meant. I know, said H, that if any part of the clothing is carried into the body by a gunshot wound, festering ensues, and therefore I have met you thus. His antagonist declared that fighting with a man in poorest naturalibus would be quite ridiculous, and accordingly they parted without further discussion. Lord Alvinley, on returning home after his duel with young O'Connell, gave a guinea to the hackney coachman who had driven him out and brought him back. The man, surprised at the largeness of the sum, said, My lord, I only took you two, blank. Alvinley interrupted him. My friend, the guinea is for bringing me back, not for taking me out. I was on a visit to Lord Bath at Longleat when I received a letter from Beckford inviting me to Font Hill. I went there and stayed three days. On arriving at the gate, I was informed that neither my servant nor my horses could be admitted, but that Mr. Beckford's attendants and horses should be at my service. The other visitors at that time were Smith, who published views in Italy, and a French ecclesiastic, a very elegant and accomplished man. During the day, we used to drive about the beautiful grounds in pony chaises. In the evening, Beckford would amuse us by reading one of his unpublished works, or he would extemporise on the pianoforte, producing the most novel and charming melodies, which, by the by, his daughter, the Duchess of Hamilton, can do also. I was struck rather by the refinement than by the magnificence of the hospitality at Fonthill, I slept in a bedroom which opened into a gallery where lights were kept burning the whole night. In that gallery was a picture of St. Antonio to which it was said that Beckford would sometimes steal and pay his devotions. Beckford read to me the two unprinted episodes of Vatek, and they are extremely fine but very objectionable on account of their subjects. Indeed, they show that the mind of the author was to a certain degree diseased. The one is the story of a prince and princess, a brother and sister. The other is the tale of a prince who was violently enamoured of a lady, and who, after pursuing her through various countries, at last overtakes her, only to find her a corpse. In one of these tales there is an exquisite description of a voyage down the Nile. Beckford is the author of two burlesque novels, Azemia and The Elegant Enthusiast. I have a copy of the former which he presented to me. He read to me another tale which he had written, a satirical one. It was in French and about a man who was ridiculously fond of dogs, etc., etc. I have been told that a part of his own life was shadowed out in it. This tale he never printed. In fact, he had no wish to obtain literary reputation. He despised it. I have seen Beckford shed tears while talking of his deceased wife. His eldest daughter, Mrs. Ord, who has been long dead, was both in appearance and disposition a perfect angel. 
her delight was not to be admired herself but to witness the admiration which her sister the duchess of hamilton never failed to excite beckford was eventually reduced to such straits that he was obliged to part with his pictures one by one the last picture which he sold to the national gallery was bellini's portrait of the doge of venice it was hung up the very day on which beckford died the duke of hamilton wrote a letter to me requesting that it might be returned to the family but his application came too late when porson dined with me i used to keep him within bounds but i frequently met him at various houses where he got completely drunk he would not scruple to return to the dining-room after the company had left it pour into a tumbler the drops remaining in the wine glasses and drink off the omnium gatherum i once took him to an evening party at william spencer's where he was introduced to several women of fashion lady crew etc who were very anxious to see the great grecian how do you suppose he entertained them chiefly by reciting an immense quantity of old forgotten vauxhall songs he was far from sober and at last talked so oddly that they all retired from him except lady crewe who boldly kept her ground i recollect her saying to him mr porson that joke you have borrowed from joe miller and his rather angry reply madam it is not in joe miller you will not find it either in the preface or in the body of that work no nor in the index i brought him home as far as piccadilly where i'm sorry to add i left him sick in the middle of the road when any one told porson that he intended to publish a book porson would say remember that two parties must agree on that point you and the reader i asked him what time it would take him to translate the iliad literally and correctly into english prose he answered at least ten years he used to say that something may be pleaded as a sort of excuse for the wickedness of the worst characters in shakespeare for instance iago is tortured by suspicions that othello has been too intimate with his wife richard the third the murderer of children has been bitterly taunted by one of the young princes etc if i had a carriage said porson and if i saw a well-dressed person on the road i would always invite him in and learn of him what i could such was his love of knowledge he was fond of repeating these lines and wrote them out for me what fools are mankind and how strangely inclined to come from all places with horses and chaises by day and by dark to the falls of lanark for good people after all what is a waterfall it comes roaring and grumbling and leaping and tumbling and hopping and skipping and foaming and dripping and struggling and toiling and bubbling and boiling and beating and jumping and bellowing and thumping i have much more to say upon both lynn and bonnet on but the trunks are tied on and i must be gone these lines evidently suggested to southey his playful verses on the cataract of lodore readers note the following remarks were made by porson when prometheus made man he had used up all the water in making other animals so he mingled his clay with tears porson would almost cry when he spoke of euripides why should i write from myself while anything remains to be done to such a writer as euripides when repeating a generous action from antiquity or describing a death like persians his eyes would fill and his voice falter of mackintosh he means to get interest on his principal of sheridan he is a promising fellow all wit true reasoning 
I love an octavo. The pages are soon read. The milestones occur frequently. If I had three thousand pounds per annum, I would have a person constantly dressed night and day with fire and candle to attend upon me. He is an uncertain sleeper. I must confess to have a very strong prejudice against all German original literature. In drawing a villain, we should always furnish him with something that may seem to justify himself to himself. Authority should serve to excite attention, and no farther. End of section 16